So as many of you may know, I've been on a sort of classic game binge as of late, playing all these old ass NES games from your childhood for the first time. Are they good? Are they bad? Do they hold up in 2023? Those are all the questions we're answering today for Kirby's Dreamland. Let's get started. Many of you probably know Masahiro Sakurai from his Smash hit, well, Smash, but this actually is his debut game. In 1992, Kirby's Dream Land came to be, a platformer focused on simplicity and fun with the characters we all know and love. And you know how this is the Kirby we know today? Well, actually, in this game, he was not yet the pink puff, he was more of a cotton ball because he didn't yet have his signature pink color. They didn't even know what to do with him, but it didn't even really matter because the Game Boy, either way, could not support these color graphics. But anyways, Sakurai set out to make a game that wasn't quite as punishing as many of the games in this era. Many Game Boy and NES games got most of their longevity because of their difficulty. They didn't quite have the space on those cartridges to make super long games like we have now, but that difficulty could essentially artificially bulk up the hours. Sakurai saw this trend and instead of making another punishing game that blends in with the others, he set himself apart by focusing on fun and accessibility. Kirby has that signature flow ability that allows you to easily bypass whole levels, and yes, there is occasionally challenge, but the challenge is never really the main focus of the game in any way. I think that this is what has gone into making Kirby one of the best Game Boy games to play in 2023. Like I said earlier, Kirby doesn't focus on difficulty and allows for replayability to be the main focus of getting more hours out of the game. I simply love this, and I think that's why I had such a good time with the game. It's fun Fun and such a cool way to see where the series came from, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. So to start out this game, I streamed it, and it was a great time. I love the platforming here because you can either take down every enemy and treat it as a normal platformer, or you can sort of float above it all being a fluffy pacifist. It allows for really any playstyle. The graphics are also very good looking, especially for a Game Boy game, and I did play this on Switch Online, so I'm not really dealing with that dim, no backlit Game Boy screen, but running on the Switch, it was awesome. The visuals are great, and the game, like I said, runs very well with no problems at all. So Josie, what's the main thing Kirby does? Well, say it with me, folks. Suck and blow. <laughs> In the recent games that we have, Kirby sucks in enemies and then he gains their powers and even with things like Smash Bros, he can suck in Cloud and just gain Cloud's powers, but that has not quite been implemented in this very first Kirby game. It's easy to see where that evolution came from because obviously you're sucking in enemies, well what if you got their power? And that did come down the line, but this first game it was just really about sucking in enemies and then you can waddle around with them in there and then spit them out at other enemies to, you know, destroy him and what have you. This makes actually the boss battles a lot more challenging than newer Kirby games where you can just kind of spam the fire ability, which is usually what I do. I love the fire ability. But this made me have to dodge a lot more attacks and have to think about things because there's only certain times when that star is available to suck in and then spit out the enemy and what have you. Of course, that is still a thing in modern Kirby, but it's not quite to the same effect anymore. But just the simplicity of this game is still very fun and you can see how promising that early mechanic was. And this was so revolutionary in thinking of platformers in a different way. I mean, think about it, before this game, most platformers were really similar to Mario, where jumping on enemies' heads would just render them defeated, or they were like ghosts and goblins and you just try to throw a bunch of projectiles at them. I think this was Nintendo's way of taking that ghost and goblin formula and sort of making it their own with their own signature Nintendo charm and polish. The enemies in this game are awesome because while they can be pretty basic looking and their power-ups aren't really anything too crazy, they are oozing with personality. This whole game is really just dripping with personality. Kirby himself is a great, at the time, new mascot because of his adorable stoic nature, something that Nintendo has to this day kept consistent. The boss battles are also great because they provide a bit of that needed challenge within the game. They're not like Dark Souls level, of course, but some of them might take you a couple tries your first time around. Each boss battle, again, has so much personality and just fun spirit to them that I couldn't help but love them all. Really, all the way through, this game is something that I loved. Seeing the roots of Kirby is awesome, especially in a game that has aged as well as this one has. It's on the shorter side and it's still missing some of those tried and true Kirby mechanics we know and love, but really it's just a great game and for nothing else, play it if you love Sakurai. I mean, show his original piece of work some respect and check out this awesome blast from the past. I'm gonna give Kirby's Dream Land a solid 9 out of 10. I think it's fantastic to see where the series came from. If you loved Forgotten Land and you're itching to go back to Kirby, I mean, if you have Nintendo Switch Online, this game is free on there for you, so just check Check it out and uh, let me know what you think in the comments down below if you like this video subscribe like the video obviously and check out this video wow it's a great one 
it's a really, really, really great one.